When the average person thinks about people from the ancient world, there are only a few names that will immediately come to mind. Jesus, King Tut, Julius Caesar, Nero, and Alexander the Great. Alexander was possibly the greatest military leader of the ancient world, perhaps in all of world history. Alexander was never defeated in battle, and from his small kingdom on the outskirts of Greece, he conquered the greatest empire in the world at the time. We cannot argue that Alexander was a great military leader, but was he really great? Should we admire him or despise him? In this video, we'll take a brief look at his career and then try our best to come to terms with his legacy. But first, if you love history like I do, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. That way you'll be the first to know when new videos are published. Also, let me know in the comments why you think Alexander was great or not great. The Kingdom of Macedonia was a troubled land where political assassination was a common path to the throne. In 360 BC, the King of Macedonia, Perdiccas III, was killed in a battle for territory against the Illyrians. Perdiccas fell along with 4,000 of his men. His younger brother Philip was appointed to serve as regent for Perdiccas's young son Amentus. But Philip seized the opportunity and declared himself king in 359 BC. Surprisingly, Philip did not kill his nephew. Instead, he allowed him an honored position at the court. One of Philip's achievements was the building up of the Macedonian army, perhaps as part of a future plan to invade the Persian Empire. Polygamy was common in Macedonia, especially amongst the nobility. By his fourth wife, Olympias, Philip had a son, who he named Alexander in 356 BC. Philip made it clear that he intended for Alexander, who showed great talent at an early age, to become his successor. However, in 338 BC, Philip married his seventh and final wife, Cleopatra, who was of more noble and pure Macedonian blood than Olympias. The couple first had a daughter named Europa, but when Cleopatra bore him a son named Caranus in 337 BC, it seriously compromised Alexander's position as heir. As fate would have it, Philip didn't live to invade Persia. He was assassinated in 336 BC at the wedding celebration of his daughter. It has been suggested that Alexander and his mother Olympias were behind the assassination. Conveniently, if Alexander and Olympias were indeed behind the murder, the assassin was killed at the scene by two of Alexander's friends. After becoming king, Alexander had any potential rivals to his power killed. First his cousin, the former king Amentus, was executed. Alexander also ordered the death of his rival Caranus, but his vindictive mother Olympias had both Caranus and Europa burned alive due to her hostility towards Cleopatra. After the horrible deaths of her young children, Cleopatra took her own life. Alexander immediately began laying the foundation for an invasion of Asia Minor, which was then part of the Persian Empire. Alexander crossed the Bosphorus and defeated Persian forces in small battles. The Persian king, Darius III, initially didn't see Alexander as a serious threat. However, once Alexander penetrated far into Persian territory, Darius's attitude began to change. In 333 BC, Darius was roused to action. He met Alexander at the Battle of Issus, was defeated by the Greeks, and fled the field. In order to save his own skin, Darius fled so quickly that he left behind his wife, mother, and children, all of whom had come with him on this campaign. The cowardly king sent Alexander a letter offering a huge ransom, half of his kingdom, and marriage to his daughter if he would return his family. Alexander sent the great king a stinging reply. In the future, whenever you communicate with me, address your letter to me as king of Asia. Do not write to me as an equal, but state your demands to the master of all your possessions. If not, I will deal with you as a criminal. If you wish to lay claim to the title of king, then stand your ground and fight for it. Do not take to flight, as I shall pursue you wherever you may go. 
After this devastating response, Darius never wrote to Alexander again. He fled first into Media, and then further east into Parthia, where finally he was assassinated by a relation of his who hoped to take his throne. When Alexander recovered Darius's body, he had it buried with royal honors next to his ancestors. After the death of the Persian king, Alexander adopted many Persian customs, such as Persian manners of dress, and having his subjects bow before him and kiss his hand, something that was unheard of in Greece. This alienated many of Alexander's supporters, and his troops who expected to return home after the defeat of Persia. In Egypt, Alexander was regarded as a liberator and was crowned pharaoh. During this ceremony, he sacrificed to the ancient Egyptian gods. While in Egypt, he established the city of Alexandria, which was to become one of the greatest and most prosperous cities in the ancient world and the new capital of Egypt. With the world now before him, Alexander decided to march further east into India. His behavior in battle became more and more reckless. Perhaps he felt invincible, or perhaps he didn't care if he lived or died. But Alexander would often seek to be the first over the walls of a city in an attack, which led to his being wounded severely on more than one occasion. Alexander also became more cruel as time went on and he ventured further east. After one battle in which he was wounded, he ordered every man, woman, and child in the town killed, and every building completely destroyed. In 326 BC, Alexander crossed the Indus River into the Punjab region of India, where he encountered King Porus, against whom he fought an enormous battle. Alexander defeated Porus, but was deeply impressed both by Porus's bravery and his war elephant. Alexander named the elephant Ajax and dedicated it to the sun god Helios. He ordered the animal's tusks, covered in gold, bearing an inscription honoring the elephant and Alexander. He also made brave Porus, a client king, who would rule India on Alexander's behalf. Far to the east lay the Ganges River and the Nanda Empire, which Alexander was told bore great wealth. But he was also told, truthfully, that the Ganges River was three miles wide and 600 feet deep, and falsely, that after it a vast desert had to be crossed. Although Alexander was ready to make the journey, his men refused and mutinied on the banks of the Hyphasis River, refusing to go any further. They told him that they wished to see their parents, wives, children, and the land of their birth again. Thus, the Hyphasis marked the eastern boundary of Alexander's conquests. He turned around and marched back to Persia after ordering his naval forces to explore the northern Indian Ocean and Persian Gulf region. After his return to Babylon in 323 BC, Alexander took up residence in the palace that once belonged to Nebuchadnezzar II. While there, Alexander threw a huge multi-day banquet that involved heavy drinking and overeating. During the course of this banquet, Alexander developed a fever but due to the pressure of his guests, he continued to binge drink until he collapsed and had to be carried to his quarters in the palace. Eventually, his condition worsened. He lost the ability to speak. After several days, his troops grew worried that he had died, and several were chosen to visit him. They were shown that he was alive, and he nodded or waved at them, according to contemporary accounts. Alexander developed acute pain, and finally, after 11 days of suffering, he slipped into a coma. After an illness of 14 days, on the night of June 10th through 11th, 323 BC, with his army anxiously waiting by torchlight outside, the greatest military leader of the ancient world died at the age of 32. Many theories have been suggested as the cause of his death. Modern scholars have concluded that he died of malaria, typhoid fever, a perforation of the bowel, meningitis, pancreatitis, appendicitis, West Nile virus, cirrhosis of the liver, alcohol poisoning, syphilis, and pneumonia, to name but a few. It has also been suggested that he was poisoned, 
and assassination was very common amongst the Macedonian nobility. At this remote date, we will probably never know for sure what killed Alexander, but we can be sure that his constitution was weakened by repeated wounds and heavy alcohol consumption, along with severe illnesses contracted on his campaigns. After Alexander died, his empire was divided into four more manageable-sized kingdoms that were ruled over by four of his most prominent generals. His body was stolen by the general Ptolemy, who had claimed Egypt as his kingdom. The body was placed in a golden casket that was filled with honey and transported to Alexandria, Egypt, where it was buried in an opulent tomb. After Egypt became a Roman province, the tomb was visited by Augustus Caesar, Caligula, and other emperors. The tomb was finally closed in AD 199 by Septimius Severus, but was visited again in AD 215 by the emperor Caracalla, who, it is said, took items from the tomb. After 215, the tomb is not mentioned again, and its whereabouts, along with the remains of Alexander himself, are now unknown. In 327 BC, Alexander had married the Bactrian princess Roxana. At the time of Alexander's death, Roxana was pregnant. It was decided by loyalists to Alexander that they would await the birth of the baby, and if it was a boy, name it the king of Macedonia, and appoint themselves as the infant baby's caretaker. As it turned out, the baby was a boy who was named Alexander in his father's honor and was the new Macedonian king from the moment of his birth. However, an infant king always invites palace plots. Eventually, a rival seized power, and the young king, and only child of Alexander the Great, was killed along with his mother. In ancient times, greatness was often measured by the number of corpses left in a general's wake. In Alexander's case, those corpses number in the hundreds of thousands. Or success was measured by the size of the lands that he conquered, which in Alexander's case was millions of square miles. Alexander also defeated and destroyed many independent kingdoms, and is said to have founded 70 cities. However, I believe it is fair to ask if conquest alone, or even conquest at all, makes a man great. Can we call a king who failed to provide for his own family's well-being great? If Alexander had been more cautious, could he have lived long enough to have allowed his son to grow up and have a chance to live and succeed his father? Alexander built a vast empire, but he gave little thought to what would become of that empire and its millions of residents after he died. And as it turned out, his empire lasted mere weeks after his death. It was split up, and decades of wars over his former territory followed. It is fair to see Alexander, like all humans, as a more complex figure than I think he is commonly considered to be. We cannot, from our distant vantage point, get into his head and analyze his thoughts or motives. We cannot say for sure that he was involved in the assassination of his father, for instance. We cannot know why he was so driven to conquer. But his hands are surely stained with many acts that we would consider atrocities. At the same time, he also expanded the awareness of the classical world. He connected East and West in a way that had never been done before. He left a legacy that impacted the psyche of the ancient world and changed Greek civilization. And he had a massive impact on the thinking of the Romans, especially during the late Republic and early Imperial periods. In the end, I am uncomfortable saying that Alexander was great. But I also cannot say that he wasn't. I do believe that our modern world would be vastly different if Alexander had not lived, but I do not know if it would be different for the better or worse. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. That way you'll be the first to know when new videos are published. Thank you for watching.